been a visiting professor uh, in Japan, Australia, the Netherlands, uh, etc. Before moving to Emory, he taught at the Center for Studies in Social Sciences in Kolkata, uh, the University of Delhi, and uh, Johns Hopkins University. He um, has been a founding member and leading theorist of the Subaltern Studies Project, um, which has been well represented at Columbia, so <laughs> you're coming into um, an audience that is uh, very uh, aware of, of this uh, important project. And um, he's written extensively on colonial and post-colonial South Asia, nationalism and minorities, civil rights and democracy, and the history of history writing. Among his uh, monographs are A History of Prejudice, Race, Caste, and Difference in India and the U.S. in uh, 2013, Routine Violence, Nations, Fragments, and History in 2006, The Construction of Communalism in Colonial North India, um, which um, my notes say revised edition 2006, so I'm not sure when the original was, <laughs> but <laughs> anyway. Communalism? 1990, I think. 1990, I think. Um, the Ascendancy of the Congress in uh, Uttar Pradesh, Class, Community, and Nation in Northern India, 1920 to 1940. And Remembering Partition, Violence, Nationalism, and History in India in 2001. Um, lots of books. Uh, three of his monographs are, are collected in the Gyanandra Pandey Omnibus um, from 2008. And, his, and I just want to mention, uh, because the title of, since I work on, um, you know, much of my work is on Muslims in South Asia, and knowing the current uh, issues concerning the position of Muslims in South Asia today, um, his, the, the title of his 1999 article, Can a Muslim Be an Indian, which was published in Comparative Studies in Society and History, which asks a question that is, is a vital concern today, um, where he traces the history of the construction of what he calls the unhyphenated national, the real, obvious, axiomatically natural citizen, and the simultaneous construction of the hyphenated one, such as the Indian Muslim. Um, Professor Pandey is currently working on a book on politics and democracy in the late 20th and early 21st centuries in which India and the US serve as primary examples. Um, and his, his latest book, which we'll be hearing about today, um, is called Fragments of Family, Men at Home in Colon Colonial and Post-Colonial India, which I believe is due to appear in 2024. Is That's that correct? That's what they say. That's what they say, <laughs> okay. So um, we are hearing it um, pre-publication, which is great. And whether we have any input or not is another question, but. <laughs> um, so please join me in, in wel welcoming uh, Gyan Pandey. Uh, thank you all, and, and thank you, Kathy. Uh, <coughs> um, Kathy's introduction um, uh, makes it clear how much of a maverick I am. I've taught in all sorts of places, I've written on all sorts of things. <laughs> but I do want to stress that the writing has all been concern concerned with marginalized communities and people. Mm. Someone asked me when I wrote my book on race and caste, uh, when I, I moved to the States, I was working on Dalits in India when I moved here. And I decided after a couple of years, or three or four years here, that I actually lived here. I wasn't just a visitor. And I should engage with the, my surroundings and the history of this place. And so I wrote a book on the civil rights struggle amongst Dalits in India and African Americans here. And someone at NYU, uh, when I talked about that, actually said, how did you move from there to here? meaning from communalism, nationalism, and those sorts of, to here. <coughs> and uh, that's why I just want to say that. I moved from that to men in the home who are not the marginals, but who allow, allow us to talk about marginality within the home, within domestic space. Uh, my work has had that common thread of thinking histories 
that are not foregrounded, uh, which is what suburban studies try to do as well. Um, so we keep trying. Uh, and Kathy said, don't know if your feedback will mean anything. It means everything. A book is only a stop on a journey. And we're all investigating these same questions. And I want to say with Kathy, I'm most grateful that you all have come out here on a Friday afternoon <laughs> and uh, at a time when there's so much else going on in the world. Uh, it's actually hard to go to seminars, it's hard to go to places where you have to discuss the news, but this might be a nice distraction in the sense that it's not about the most urgent things on the face of it. It's not about the violence taking place everywhere else. But it is about violence in the most intimate of spaces. And finally, I want to uh, thank Kathy also because she said, wouldn't you like to have a discussant? And kindly offered to be a discussant to set off the discussion. So it's lovely to see old friends here. It's been such a long time since I've seen Sid Mahmood and Lenny and Marini and you know people kind of <laughs> disappeared, and, and new friends like Shopna Banerjee, whose book, of course, is one of the few things that actually addresses the question of men in the home, in colonial and post-colonial India. She has a wonderful book on fatherhood in the motherland, published last year, in which Oxford University Press Delhi hasn't done a great job with, but the contents are very good, very well worth <laughs> reading. So please uh, do, do look out for that. Um, I have a difficult task because when you've just finished a book, you're actually so closely engaged with it, and I'm still the copy editing <laughs> responses are coming, so I'm still uh, fiddling with it, if you like, tweaking phrases here and there, that sort of thing. But you begin to think, what have I put together here? And I want to, um, I'm, I'm going to go over some of the major points that I. Um, major themes that inform the book. But I want to begin by saying, I think th if there is a contribution that this book makes, it will be because of the detail in it. Because it details <coughs> things that we know on the face of it, or impressionistically. And it details them from in unexpected quarters. I have an epilogue which is about my family, uh, my own, my own domestic space and existence in that space and the epilogue is just an epilogue but I say I put it there because I said traces of the history that I have <coughs> tried to outline continue they appear in unexpected places in unexpected ways in unexpected people myself included right um, unexpected to me <laughs> so, um, <coughs> so in that sense the detail is really vital to what I'm saying. And therefore, I can't do too much with that today. Also, I try to cover a range of things. Uh, because to, to write a book on men at home in colonial and post-colonial India is so grand and so ambitious, I had to choose what would be useful, a useful variety of cases, a useful variety of examples, documenting the different kinds of castes, communities, classes, and so on. And so what I do is I talk about <coughs> elite groups amongst the Hindus and the Muslims, the Sharif log, the Bade log, uh, the Bhadra log, as the Bengalis have it. Um, but I also talk about the Chote log, the Choto log, the down and out, the working people. And I use Dalit writings, and I use the Dalit example, partly because I've worked on it some length, for that particular aspect of it. Now these are very, very different kinds of communities, different settings. This is, uh, my work is mainly in northern, central India, to some extent in Punjab. And I use the Western Indian examples partly because I know Marathi, I've read stuff in Dali, on Dalits, um, uh, focused on Maharashtra to a large extent. And because I use Guj uh, Gujarat as a reasonably prominent example in what I have. I refer to the Bengali literature, which of course is the one that always dominates these debates, which in this instance has also focused very much on the Badra look. Uh, and that's the case because of documentation and so on and so forth. Anyway, so um, th this will be a bit scattered 
<laughs> that's, the, that's the reason for saying what I'm saying. Um, the book itself is concerned, it does two or three things um, as they hopes to do, let's say. Okay. It locates men firmly in domestic space. They belong here. They depend on it in all sorts of ways, though they deny that. Or there is some kind of pre pretense that they don't really need to be there. It just happens, you know, it's okay. They don't even need that space. <coughs> they don't need the domestic. Um, so there's a very strange position of being present absent. And that's what I'm concerned with much of the way through uh, in the book. But I wanted to do something more. That, once again, you know, much of this will look familiar. And I do, I do want to say it is familiar. We all know it. The detailing counted. But here's another level at which I felt that perhaps it is not, we do not know it so well in the sense, it's like thinking about caste. We all know about caste. There's casteism in India. Think about race. We know, all, all know there's racism in the United States. We do not know what it feels, what living this out, living out discrimination, oppression, marginalization, humiliation, or living out hauteur. The, the, the privilege of being a man, privilege of being white, what that means, what consequences it has, not only for the subordinated and the marginalized and the oppressed and the humiliated, but also for those who um, are privileged. It has consequences for them, and I'll speak a little bit about that. Uh, it, it, it expresses itself in all sorts of interesting ways in that domestic space as well as outside it. So, a lot of the book is concerned with the uh, feel of inhabiting, of being embedded in these hierarchical structures, practices of discrimination, practices of um, uh, disciplining, the, the, uh, the demand that you conform for all sorts of reasons, above all that it was always done, or that the respect, the honor of the family or the community or the nation depends on it. The final thing I want to say, my book is by choice a book about ordinary life amongst ordinary people in ordinary space, in the domestic space. It is not a book about the nation or the state and I have to, I have to, I have to work hard to pull myself back from that. <coughs> Nonetheless, I do, do believe that it has a lot to say about the modern in India, about what the texture of life in this modern country, which claimed to be a democracy and was democratic in, in quite remarkable ways, um, and a great, uh, in a country that was making great strides, was struggling and has continued to struggle to produce a different version of the modern, if you like, but our own. South Asia's own modernity, South Asia's own democracy, own way of living in a world that is a difficult world to, to live in, yeah. more and more and more so, mm -hmm. as we know. So that's the overall thrust of thing. You'll have to, I'm South Asian, I'm an academic, I can go on forever. <laughs> so, Just so, keep going. <laughs> so tell me, tell me roughly how long is okay, first of all, oh, just so that I aim I mean, for it at least. I mean, I think aiming to about one or even a little bit okay. afterwards is all okay. Right. Um, uh, so yeah, I've, I don't know how I've complicated know. my life even more, or Kathy has anyway. <laughs> um, I knew I didn't have that much time, but then that's appropriate because I'd very much like to hear you. But it does mean that everything I'm going to, to say is going to be more staccato. No, no, you, oh, can, you, can, yes, right. you can take more time. I, mean, I was just, that was a rough guess. So, <laughs> I wondered how I should present this detail, this range of themes and so on. And I decided since I finished a book and since there are concluding chapters, I might use one of the concluding chapters um, as um, providing me a structure to, to, to speak. And so I was going to, I have two concluding chapters in a part of the book which I call History in a Visceral Register. Visceral, where you can feel physically things, okay? And I, I say that deliberately because I think that is the one register that we as academics 
really find it, especially historians, anthropologists try in various ways, but everywhere I think the similar problem arises. The visceral register is hard to touch. It is very hard to document. It's very hard to, for, uh, for us to even speak about in some ways. Um, so what I say at the beginning of that, uh, those concluding sections, I would like at least to try and touch the visceral register, ask the question. And that may be enough. If that's all I do, if it raises the question and people do wonderful research, follow up or, you know, challenge it in whatever ways, that will be enough for me. But I want to touch that question of how it felt to be there. And so I'm <coughs> going, to, going to use chapter six. I have seven substantive chapters plus other things in the book. I was going to use chapter six, which is called The Things That Men Touched. That it's literally, in many ways, about what they touched in the home. You know, they touched their beds to sleep on, they never touched them to make them, or clean them, or, you know, wash them, or wash the bedclothes. Uh, they touched the women for sex. Never their emotions, if you like. I mean, I'm giving you that. <laughs> It'd be hard, <laughs> brutal version of it. But there's a lot of detail that I uh, go through there. To try to just demonstrate what they did touch. They don't cook. They eat the food. They touch the food. They never cook, or at least you know they don't cook unless there's a very special occasion and they have to cook the chicken curry or whatever it is, as as a demonstration. But anyhow, um, through the period that I'm talking about, which is from the later 19th century to the later 20th century, that's primarily my um, the, the marker, chronological marker. Uh, things have changed and things are very different in different communities. I want to say that too. But what I've just said, they never cook, applies to the working classes too. It is not the case that, you know, you can say, okay, you're just talking about the Bhadra book. They, it, I document it for all of the groups that I'm talking about. In, in a remarkable way, that's the tendency. That's not my job. That's somebody else's. Uh, in any case, I was going to use that, that chapter, but I realized the detail was made that was what made that chapter what it is. And I can't actually detail all of that. So I'm not going to use that. It really just seemed too scattered, a bit, you know, we all know this, what does it add up to? And so I'm going to use the very last chapter, which is chapter 7, and it's called The Nature of Men. And again, that's provocative, it's delib deliberately polemical, it's what people are always talking about with regard to women. There's a particular nature, there's a particular way you can characterize women. Well, let's try and characterize men, I say. So I use this, and I do it through three, uh, just exploring three sort of themes, threads. One is men's thinking about the nature of women. So what men th say about w women are fundamentally that. These are their <coughs> aptitudes. This is, this is what they're meant to be. They, they do it so w wonderfully. And they need to do, say all of that because they depend on it. There's no other way. It will not function unless this argument is made, made strongly. So I'm going to um, <coughs> speak about that thread. And I will use one, per, one example primarily to, to speak about the thread, and that's Harivan Shrai Bachchan. Arvan Shai Bachchan is Amitabh Bachchan's father, just to, to make sure that everybody knows who I'm talking about. But he was a very well-known poet in his own time. He was a bureaucrat, he was an intellectual university teacher. Uh, he worked in the government, um, Jawaharlal Nehru took him to Delhi and appointed him to, for, as a translator in the, uh, I think, External Affairs Ministry or somewhere. And he, said, uh, he had a wonderful career. And he's written a four-volume autobiography. Um, about his life and loves. It's really a very candid autobiography. It's a kind of, you know, this, is, this was my life and I'm not going to hide anything. And he has some absolutely remarkable statements about what women are, what men are, what he as a poet is, okay. which sums up for me or allows me to give you an indication of the arguments I'm trying to make through them. The second person I will take on and the second theme I will take on is men's thinking about the aptitudes of men, right. which is what we are particularly made for, what we are supposed to do. And I use Rahul Sankirtan for this. Rahul Sankirtan is this great Buddhist scholar, Mahapandit, 
Uh, he wrote hundreds and hundreds of books, absolutely, tens of thousands of pages, and he was called the Mahapandit. He was a communist, he was a nationalist, he was a peasant organizer. He, he grew up, you know, he was born in a Hindu household in Bihar, um, and left home after child marriage, um, which, which he stayed in for, what, ten years, uh, what the marriage was, I don't know. Uh, but he abandoned his wife left her and basically pretty much never saw her again. Married twice subsequently. The second time was when he had become a communist, or yes, he had become a communist. He was in Russia teaching at the um, Institute in Leningrad, the Oriental Institute in Leningrad. And he set up home with his common law wife from, from whom he had a son. Um, and then he, he had to come back to India. I think he also wanted to come back to India to get involved in his intellectual and political work. He was a real seeker for, uh, for, of knowledge and, and a fighter for social justice. He was, uh, quite a remarkable man in many, many ways. But he abandoned his wife, and when he came back, five months after he was back, they had a son, and he saw the son five years later when he went back, and saw them for two years at that time, and never saw them again. He came away once again to do his work. And that's an indication of what, and then he writes, the, the reason I'm taking him on is, he writes a very major, little text, but major text, called Gumakkar Shastra, the philosophy of wandering. And I'm going to just take that up, because that's what the accomplished man must live, that sort of life. I'm going to talk about that. And I want to say right away once again, those who are not accomplished, those who are not doing these grand ambition things, still live the same kind of life. We still need to be out. We need, we need to function in the world and, you know, um, fulfill ourselves in all sorts of ways. <clears throat> and the last thing I'm going to talk about, if, if I have time, it's important I do at least just a little bit, is I'm going to talk about women's thinking, about men's thinking on the nature of men. Okay? And I do that just from... Um, well, there are several examples, I have, but I have to take several different examples to make the argument in this instance. I'll take two primarily and I'll explain uh, why I take them. One is Rahul Sankirtan's third wife, who was a um, lower caste schoolgirl. She had just finished high school when he met her. She was 19, he was 57. They, they met, uh, he was 56. They married a year later. but. She completes, he writes a six volume autobiography, which is like a daily diary of all his life. It's enormously detailed and enormously rich. She completed the fifth and the sixth volumes. And in the course of completing them, she has remarkable comments. And she became a very fine Hindi and Nepali. She, the, the family was originally from, from Nepal. Um, she became a very fine writer and well-known writer in Nepali and in Hindi. Uh, so in various writings and in this, the, the two volumes that she compiles and, and, and publishes, um, she has huge numbers of comments on a man she worshipped, on a man who was very good to her in all sorts of ways. Kalam ke sipahi hain she would say. We, as a family, my husband and I, uh, Rahulji and, and herself, Kamla, um, were soldiers of the, with the pen, right? The soldiers of knowledge, of books, right, that sort of thing. Um, but in that very worshipful thing, she has some <coughs> remarkable comments on what he still used to do. I could not have believed this of such a great man, of such a high soul. That, that's, so I'll use her and I'll use uh, a Dalit writer called Baby Kamble, who wrote the, one of the first women's autobiographies uh, amongst the uh, Dalits. In the 19, in 1989, it was published. No, it was published in the 1990s. She wrote it in hiding for 20 years. She was scribbling day by day in the course of her housework and other things in the home, and she hid it from everybody except one brother, uh, who used to bring her pages, you know, things she could scribble on, and she hid it for 20 years. It was the accident of an American. Um, college student, a, a graduate student, visiting the area, visiting there, that thing, finding out that she had written something. And she said, will you, uh, will you show it to me? And Baby Kamla showed it to her. And she said, do you mind if we get this published? And Baby Kamla was not quite sure and said, okay. 
and it was published in magazines in Pune in their, uh, and in their, what are they called, festival uh, numbers, which are these big numbers that come out in, uh, at various times of year. And it was then that the family discovered that she had been writing in hiding for 20 years. And she has a remarkable interview with my colleague Maya Pandit from Hyderabad, who translated her Marathi autobiography into English. And that is revealing in the extreme about what she had to deal with. And she, in the course of that interview, she talks about Navrapana, which is husbandness. Navra is Marathi husband. Navrapana, husbandness, husbandly authority, the, the assertion of, of men's privilege as being the character of men. She says that. And I actually believe she, she makes a remarkable, remarkable statement there. So I will use her finally. To, you see, I have, do I have two hours or three? <laughs> okay. Um, so let me just try and do this, at least give you some sense of all things. That are the first one I'm going to use, and this is probably the most familiar to you, but Bachchan's rendering of it may be worth listening to it just a little bit, um, is the notion of the girl woman as nothing but mother. You know that in Ravindranath Tagore's Ghare um, Bhaire, and, and in Bengali writing and in Hindi writing and so on and so forth, um, even little girls are referred to as little mother. Chotoma, yeah? And it's an extraordinary statement that you address. I, I heard this in, I taught in Calcutta and worked in Calcutta for many years. I heard this on the street all the time. And I asked Partho, my, my colleague Partho Chatterjee, one of the other. Yeah. We've heard of him. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and uh, well, one of these uh, other people that people are frowning upon as subaltern studies people, right? <laughs> and, yeah. um, uh, I asked Partho, you know, is this true in uh, or Muslim Bengal? I mean, is it true of Muslim? And he said, it's true in Bangladesh. It's used all the time, everywhere. So it really is very, very widespread. That's, uh, and it's that notion of the child as mother, the girl child, that we're going to talk about. You get it in Gandhi, you get it in Raji and the Prashad, you get it in Prem Chand, you, you get it everywhere you're reading. That this notion of the mother and the special maternal instinct that all women are best blessed with, not asking women what they have to go through to live up to this image, anyhow. So, Bachchan, in his, this detailed, candid account of his um, life and loves, talks about many, many of his uh, close encounters, his sexual, emotional encounters with women. And I'm going to refer to only three of them. Uh, he married twice. I'll refer to the two marriages. And I'll refer to his very first love, which was the teenage love. He fell in love, or was completely infatuated with, his a non-kin brother. He had a large family, a non-kin brother in a neighboring house in Allahabad where his parents had settled, his parents lived. Um, this non-kin brother was married to a young girl. He must have been, I guess he would have been in his late teens. The, the brother, <coughs> Bachchan himself, was in his mid-teens. The wife may have been Bachchan's age or younger. In any event, Champa, uh, is the name of the of the woman, and unfortunately, soon after that marriage, the brother, the bridegroom, dies. Very, very within within months. Bachchan and Karkal, the name of the man, they are so close. They 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 really are blood brothers, but they're, they're not blood brothers. They they're like blood brothers. <laughs> they're non crin brothers, uh, but they are the closest buddies. Jigri dost hain, bilkul yaar hain, you know, together all the time. He writes at one place, if Karkal could, would, uh, would have his way, I would have been with him on his wedding night. But, but society would have frowned upon it, so <laughs> they weren't able to do it. In any case, so these two spent all their time with the bride. Anyway, when she, and, and she, she's very fond of both of them, when her husband dies, 
Bachchan spends all his time grieving with her. And they're just like for months, she doesn't utter a word. She just lies on her bed and he's looking after her, you know, uh, caressing her, giving her whatever comfort. And so much so that some of the family begins to get disturbed about this. Nonetheless, in the course of that, as he says, unexpectedly, anjane uh, mein, without our consciousness, we came together. And she becomes pregnant. And uh, her mother, who was actually very fond of all of them until then, notices this. And when she notices this, she tells Bachan, get out and don't, don't show your face here again. But with that, she, she also takes her daughter to the Himalayas for penance and for an abortion. And they come back after many, many months. It may, may have been as long as a year, but in any case, many months. And uh, Champa, this young girl, probably not yet mid-teen, but all the, about mid-teens, has had an abortion. <coughs> she is skin and bones. She is unrecognizable. She finish, you know. And she comes back and she and Bachchan have one last meeting the day that she comes back. She dies the next day. In that last meeting, he talks about that. So that's why I'm going to do. Luckily, the mother-in-law dies soon after because she was completely broken by everything that had happened. But anyway, what happened in that last meeting is that Bachchan had just failed his high school exam in the, in the time that she was away. He'd taken the high school exam and failed it. <coughs> high school law, maybe... Uh, just prior to high school. Anyway, he failed um, the, the annual exam. And she says to him, look, everything that happened was my fault. This is, this is a young, young girl. Everything that happened was my fault. But I have now done penance for it. I have done all the penance that, that's required. You must go. I will not live long, she says. And she passes the next day. But she says, you must go on with your life. You have a long life to live. You, you must return to school. You must study hard. You must achieve all the things that you can achieve and you will achieve. And he's, he is commenting on that. So he says, she to, spoke to me like a mother. And in, in his autobiography, written four decades, more than four decades after this event, 1969, Volume 1 is published. Uh, she, he writes, Champa revealed to me the mother form inherent in every woman. Right? That's his comment on this relationship. And it goes on. Um, I'll just read you one more extract because it's really quite uh, extraordinary. From the day of her return from Badrinath, from the hills, when Champa addressed me as if I were her son, took all my sins into herself, blessed me and sent me off, and then a few hours later departed this world. From that day, I have used the benediction, O Ma, O Mother, to remember her and all other women, mothers, Ma Jati Ki Sari Narya, Ma Jati Ki Sari Narya, all women, alive or dead, I have used the expression Oma for all of them who have come into my life in any form, whom I have come into, uh, uh, into touch with in any form. That's the statement that, it's an astounding statement coming from a person who's thoughtful, who's a poet, who writes Madhushala, that's what made him famous, you know, in, in honor of drinking, right? Um, uh, anyway, that Instance one. Instance two. His pa parents get him married off soon after because they think that's the only way to get him out of his grief, out of his miserable existence. And he, of course, thinks he is miserable. I mean, he, you know, and he is miserable, I have no doubt. Um, get him married to a 14-year-old girl when he's 18. He's finished. Uh, no, he's finishing high school. He's working at that. And... Um, 
he agrees to this think, thinking like his parents perhaps that you know it will give him relief it will give him the solace that he needs it will give him the support and so on that he wants. but he finds when he sees her for the first time that she is a 14 year old girl innocent a guileless child he uses those those sort of simple little innocent unworldly cheerful these are his phrases for her and so, something else quite interesting is happening. She unfortunately can live with him only for a week. Then she goes back to her parents' home in another part of Allahabad because her mother is, tuber uh, is suffering from tuberculosis. And someone has to look after the younger kids and the father. So this eldest daughter goes back to look after them. And she lives with them for the next... <coughs> till 1936 when she dies. So nearly, nearly 20 years. But uh, no, for ten years. They, they marry in 1926. So, for ten years she, she's, she's living there. She's married to Bachchan. And Bachchan takes time when he can between school and tuitions he's doing to, to pay for school, etc., etc., to visit her. But they even correspond with one another across the, the city because they don't see each other, you know. And in the course of that correspondence, so, so now he's he's going to talk about this little innocent girl and what she proves to be. And so one of the things that happens is he, he hesitated to, to join the university because the fees were too high. And he was wondering about that. He spoke with her and said to her, you know, I, I'm not sure I should do this. I should get, you know, get some more work, etc., etc. And she gives him the gold jewelry she's been given by her parents. She says, this is much less important than your studies. You study. And he comments how much she had grown in one year. That's his first comment, how much she had grown in one year. Later on he says there was something divine, spiritual, devi. Something spiritual, of, the, of divinity in her. When she, she discovered she had TB and she suffered a long illness after her mother died. She suffered a long illness. She hid it from everybody. She didn't know she had TB for sure, but anyway, they found out that she did. Nonetheless, she hid her sufferings, her illness, her high fever. She would never let on. And he praises that. He talks about how she would never let on. You know, she just kept it from everybody. She did not want him, uh, I don't have the quote here in full, or his, or his father, her father, uh, father-in-law, or her father and siblings to be anxious about her. So she would not. Therefore she drew, uh, this is a quote from Bachchan, she drew on all her strength to ensure that no one knew of her disease or pain, her body's internal decay over the years. Now, I just put that to you because what she's say he's saying is, this is the Devi, this is the spirit of the mother. Right. This is what they do, self-sacrifice, in the most extraordinary way, to ensure that everybody else can go on with life, can do the things that they can do and will achieve. Uh, so women's pain counts for nothing. I mean, it, it just disappears. In his recounting, as much as in hers. Right? And that's one of the more unexpected things, that it disappears amongst the women so often. Very accomplished, very educated, very, very um, agile women. It disappears very interestingly in uh, Bachchan's second marriage, which is with uh, the, the mother of um, Amitabh and Ajitabh, uh, Teji Bachchan, a Punjabi woman who is only four years younger than Bachchan when they marry in 1942, who is teaching in Fatehchand College in, in Lahore, teaching psychology. So has a tremendous job, has been, bit, uh, has been um, engaged because her father and others pressed her to an Oxford educated Sardar who would come back and who was very accomplished and you know, handsome and obviously on the, on the way. And she found that the chemistry wasn't right. She didn't like it enough. So when, when her father moved away from Lahore to go and live with another sister, she broke the engagement. Anyway, these two meet, Bachchan and Thing, through common friends. They meet in, uh, on December 31st, 1941. And within one month, they're married. Okay. 
and she gives up her job to come and live with him in Allahabad. I will come and I will support you fully. And she has an extraordinary career in spite of that, even afterwards. Uh, but nonetheless, already she is playing into the role that he believes is her role. Right? And he describes their love because they were deeply in love, there's no doubt about it. Yeah, and, and, and wonderful together, it was really wonderfully successful. Um, oh. Keep going. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm going to rush everything. Anyway, uh, so I'm not going to quote any, uh, at all on this. I'm just going to say, he says that her love for him is rooted in <coughs> karuna and even says matra karuna. So not only in compassion, <coughs> but in the compassion of the mother. Whereas his love for her was rooted in responsibility. It's, it's, it's quite remarkable. And that her maternal instinct and her mother's being was really what defined her. This is what he says about this woman who is an extraordinary figure. Uh, Sarojini Naidu said of them when, when she, she met them together, uh, she knew that um, um, Harivan Shai Bachchan was a poet already, he was reputed as that. And he came in with his long hair, struggling, you know, the intellectual, the poet. And she says, oh, the poet and the poem. And, and she was, she was an extraordinarily beautiful woman and one who impressed people all the time and participated in all sorts of things. She went and participated in the 1942 Quit India Movement protests with students while she was pregnant. Bachchan never went to any, any <laughs> as far as I know. Anyhow, uh, I, I better not go on, but um, Bachchan goes away after the birth of their first son. Every summer he goes away for two months of military training. He joins the university uh, cadet corps to train students and to train uh, military in the Second World War. He goes away for three summers, eight-week training camps. In the summer. He goes away a year after that, after the second son has been born, to Cambridge to finish his PhD. And he, when he comes back from there, he meets the family. He sees the family at, uh, at Allahabad railway station from his compartment. And he looks at Teji, and this is what he says. What had she done to herself? The fresh flowers she wore could not hide her withered look. There's no understanding of what she's gone through. And that night, in the first, first time in, in her life, she breaks down and tells him about what she had to live with, that they had, didn't have enough money, that she was working all the time, and that the neighbors were, were gossiping, were um, being tough about all sorts of things, and making advances of all kinds. She, just, she at one point, had, um, bought a pistol, or got a pistol from somewhere and kept it with her to protect the children and herself. At night she would keep it near her. I mean, it's extraordinary work. And so that she is with it, this is a you know, surprise to Bachchan. And that says something about men's view of the nature of women. Men's view of the nature of men. And I'm, I'm going to have to do this quickly, uh, just by saying Rahul Sankritan, says categorically in Gumakarshas and in other writings. He says categorically that the accomplished human being is the human being who wanders in the search for knowledge, in the search for enlightenment, in the search for a better self and a better society. This is the only way to do it. And he gives you examples from the Buddha to the Guru Nanak to, to you know, to where you, you can na name them, to Dayanand Saraswati, um, and other makers who have made India what they are. Right? And if he wanted to, he would have gone to the Prophet Muhammad and Jesus and so on, so he could have done the same thing. These are wanderers, these are people who have gone out in search of, search of knowledge. Um, <coughs> but the interesting thing is that he actually advocates the life of wandering for women too, because he is a radical and he actually believes that men and women should ful fulfill themselves in all sorts of ways, spiritual, intellectual, uh, political, uh, sexual, emotional. He, you know, he makes these arguments over and over again. <coughs> he, 
He says, they should also be wandering. And then he says, but women have to be very careful. And he, he gives examples of women he's seen in his travels, in the mountains of the Himalayas, in the mountains in Japan, in all, all sorts of places. Um, many of the examples are, are Europeans, as it happens, and um, Japanese, Korean uh, women as well. So then he adds in the subsequent edition of the, of the um, Gumakarshas a chapter saying, I've seen this in India too, though a lot of the people whom he, women he sees are out on pilgrimage, as it happens, or are lower class, working class women, especially in the hills of northern India, whom, whom he's seen. But he says here um, that we've got to be very careful and really, he advocates uh, these men um, uh, may not be um, his terms, but the Buddhist ideal of non-desire, of turning away, as the way in which to be the accomplished human being that you need to be. And he says this is especially important for girls and women, because remember, if something goes wrong, if you get, have a, if you get into a relationship and you are pregnant, the man will walk away. He'll still he'll still go and do what he needs to do you will not be able to walk away. So non-desire, turning away, is the critical move to me. Where does that leave life, <laughs> as it were? Where does it leave the domestic world upon which all of those people depend, including Rahul Sainz then? He spent all his life in families, all the time, uh, dependent on them, working with them and reveling. And he wrote before, um, a few years after he wrote Gumakarshas, he wrote, um, um, another book called Ghumakkar Swami about a person who was just a few years uh, yeah, younger than him, I think. Uh, no, um, three or four years older than, than um, Rahul, whom he admired greatly. He came from a poor background. He'd become a sadhu, he'd wandered, he'd become a homeopath, he'd become a doctor. And he was, he was really dedicated to the kind of service he could do. Um, but this man, after doing all sorts of, and r rather like Rahul Sankhstein, he was involved in uh, political activity also. He joined the non-cooperation movement, he did all sorts of things of that kind, went to jail. Um, so in Gumakar Swami, at the age of 52, this, this Gumakar Swami marries, like Rahul did when he was 57, he married this 30-year-old girl, um, woman. Um, Gumakar Swami does the same, just a little bit younger, he's 52. The woman is the same age as Kamla Sankritan. And the interesting thing is, while that woman actually turns out to be, as, as Sankritan says, everything that Gumakar Swami could have dreamt of in a woman who could look after him, who could cook well, you know, who really cared for him, she, she cured him of all kinds of really, really severe illnesses. But she also had to exercise huge patience and she lost her temper repeatedly in the home. And this is documented by Rahul in the biography. One such instance Rahul was witness to, he was there. And after he had witnessed it, he said, you know, I was a mute onlooker. But then he writes about it in his autobiography. And he gives a five-point manifesto. I just want to finish with this because this is, again, a summation of his. A five-point five manifesto of marriage and whether it is something appropriate. And so he writes, here's point one, two, three, four, and just, an older man should never marry a young woman. He's done that. His, his dearest friend and brother, Gumakar uh, Swami, is just that. Number two, he who has not taken on the responsibilities of a, of, a, of a householder to the age of 50 should be doubly careful. Never ever, never ever. Number three, that he has not taken on the responsibilities of a householder all that time means that he was fired by some ideals. He'd done the right thing. So he must stay with those. Huh? Number four, anyone who has spent a life of, long wander, a life of uh, life wandering the world should keep far away from marriage. He's just going on and on and on about it. Finally, if in addition he is addicted to a quest for knowledge, the prohibition is absolute. So five points which are all the same point, <laughs> effectively. Okay? And so to be a man, to be mankind, men 
really need to be on their own and need to have every opportunity and of course they can't be on their own so they must depend on a, on a domestic world that will let them be on their own right? so Bachchan for example Teji Bachchan like every single thing in his house every single thing from not only cooking and so on well, servants do it as well but, but shopping, buying cars he doesn't do any of that <laughs> so, and, and he writes that he says that you know from the time we married to now to uh, 1991, when he fin finishes the fourth volume of his autobiography, I have not done a thing in the home. Teji has taken on all the responsibilities and left me free for my uh, um, creative and intellectual work. That is what is being recommended all over here. Now here's the final thing, uh, the final stream that I wanted to address, which is women's thinking about men's thinking on the nature of men in particular. And here, as I said, that interview that Baby Kamle gave to uh, her, her translator, to Maya Pandit, is revelatory in the extreme. Baby Kamle writes in her autobiography of the way in which women suffer in the Mahar community, working class community, working people's community, in the countryside of Western India where she grew up and where she lived to, to the end of her life, 2012. She talks about everybody, but she doesn't talk about herself so much. She talks about her father and how he, her father was a fairly successful contractor, who, you know, um, contra um, provided labor for government and other, um, what shall we say, projects, and did quite well, became the big man in his community, fairly well to do. Ours was the only house in which tea was drunk, is this kind of thing, okay? And she used to, as a little child, wander around her grand grandparents' village, um, sort of um, in in anklets and in, in the jewelry, you know, strutting a bit like a, like a, like a queen. But she doesn't tell us almost until uh, until this interview that her husband, who was a bit of a wastrel, who didn't have a job, she found a way to occupy him and occupy herself and get income for additional income for the family. This man was deeply suspicious of her, would not allow her out of his sight, would be, if, if she turned and looked in the direction where the ha man happened to be, he was outraged and he would beat her. And of course, along with that, as with many, many other women, she had ten, ten children in the course of the life, right? because that was also a privilege of man. You know, this was something you had to do. And three of them died. Yeah. Again, you bore all of that. And she says in that interview in the end, because Maya Pandit asked her, why did you, keep your, why did you hide your writing for 20 years? And she says, very simple words, because of my husband. He was a good man, but he was like every man. He, he, he treated women as in, an inferior being, uh, as inferior beings. Women were taught, to, uh, m men were taught to treat their women as footwear. And she says, my husband had Naurapana in him. He had this husbandness in him. That is the quality of all men. It proves to them their superiority, their sense of worth. It gives them, you know, however lowly they are, th this is the important thing, however in social, economic, political, intellectual achievements and so on, uh, unaccomplished they are, nonetheless, she's saying, this is shared. And I use that because Kamala Sankrityan says the same sort of thing in her commentary about Rahul Sankrityan. And as I said, she worshipped Rahul. She, 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 she writes, you were my God, you were my teacher, You're not just my husband. You were all of these things, as many, many husbands become or want to be. But she actually genuinely felt he had done everything to lift her, to bring her out of her poverty out, and give her opportunities. But that he did not understand what a housewife had to do, especially after they had two children. He wanted her to go to his seminars with him. He wanted her to 
travel to Tibet and, and uh, China for his research. And the, the children were, I th uh, my, to the best of my recollection, two and four at that point. And she said, you know, they fought for years uh, in the 50s after their marriage, just for that, about that. And she talks about how angry he used to be, how irritated he was about the work she was doing, how he behaved in a way he wrote in his diary constantly, she says. He never lifted a hand on me, she says. This is important. Be and many women say this, never lifted a hand on me, which actually says something about what the expectation almost was, or the fear. He never lifted a hand on me, but his entries in his diary and his entries in letters to close friends, including Kumakar Swami, about how she was not using her time well, she was not doing what she could do. She was not studying for her MA and her PhD, which he wanted, he, uh, he wanted her to do. All of which she did in time to come. But nonetheless, those entries in her diary were like slaps on my face. That, that's her, her phrase. Okay? And she says she had not expected such samanya behavior. Samanya, I'm, I'm using deliberately. Samanya is ordinary, you know low, base behavior, vulgar behavior, from such a great soul as Rahul Sankatya. Okay, <laughs> I, I finished actually. Um, and um, she, she, she writes about how this is the nature of every man, that it is there in every man, this kind of inability to see and to behave in this vulgar fashion because you disagree, because you do not see the importance of something else. And so I finish the, the chapter by saying that baby come this Navarapana and Kamla um, Sankhita's um, statement about the nature of ordinary men is actually the same thing. And it is a very interesting critique of their own position because many of these women accepted the general hierarchy and the, and the requirements of distribution of, of rights and responsibilities the, the way they were uh, in these homes. Nonetheless, this kind of, what should we say, uh, battle in their minds, battle in their minds and quite often in their expressions like these, uh, which tells us a great deal, it seems to me, about the state of living in that kind of structure, which we know, but which we do not detail. We do not touch the feeling of what it meant to be in those structures, inhabiting those structures, trying to live up to the standards of those structures, and being unable even to speak about them. I'm sorry it took so Thank long. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I warned you, though. <laughs> that's, that's great. We, we do have, we have time. Uh, and I won't speak for very long to give people a chance to um, uh, also raise their own questions. Um, I'm, I'm intrigued, intrigued about what you're, you're saying in terms of what is essentially a, a, a cultural structure of, of the family and of masculinity and uh, a man and a woman, um, at a time of, of uh, change, dramatic social change. Um, and so my, my initial question would be, are some, of the, are some of those tensions that you described at the very end, for example, a product of very different exp expectations of what a, a woman and a man should be. In other words, um, uh, Teji is being put in a, an almost untenable situation because there is this idea of the educated woman who will follow the life trajectory um, of uh, essentially this uh, ideal of knowledge and wisdom, of, you know, we're very close to a the religious ideal that's been around for a long time. Um, 
that is in tension with the kinds of support she has, or lack of support she would have at home. Um, but sort of stepping back a minute and, and thinking about um, how family structures and family dynamics work, um, the, the, the stance that you're taking kind of reminds me a bit of um, reading Fatima Mernisi's Beyond the Veil, um, where she depicted a, um, you know, writing in Morocco um, uh, in, amongst an elite um, that had been shaped by uh, French colonialism, um, depicting the status of women as um, as as low of uh, you know she and her family you know the women and her family being trapped in in a house and where all the action is going on outside in the world um, and my reaction to that book when I read it a long time ago was that there was um, a kind of evacuation of the significance of women's lives at home um, and. Um, I think also in others, you know, thinking of my own experience um, living in a Pakistani family back in the 70s for a year, um, at also a time of transforming roles of, of women. Um, also the, that, that kind of, well, the, the awareness that a lot of what the kind of the politics of the family um, was not all happening, you know, or, or the politics of the place of the family in the social world was not all happening in the realm of men. Some of it was, but the women's women's lives and roles were extremely important, uh, almost you could say politically. And of course, depending on the status of the family. Um, Women's role in arranging marriages, for example, could even have, if a family is politically significant, it could even have have political significance uh, as, as we think of it in uh, you know, more social terms. Um, so, so I think part of this, you know, I, there's always the fear of sounding like you're, ad, you know, if I, if I sort of think critically of sounding like I'm advocating for old structures, oh, maybe they worked fine. I'm not saying that. But I think some of the particular tensions that you're describing are coming out of, out of this kind of transformation. And what it feels like, you're concerned about what it feels like to be a man in the home or what it feels like to be a woman in the home. I think we need to take into account the frames of reference that people are thinking in terms of. Um, In terms of, of um, the actually the, the the respective roles of um, men and women in the family, I think to my own observations of the family dynamics in, in the family I was in, in and um, in other families in the neighborhood where I was, and one thing that struck me was that yeah the man did very much have a kind of almost ceremonial role as the authority in the family, as, as um, the decision maker. Um, certainly when, when he's talking to his friends and you know, all the women, if, if his friends come to the living room of the home, all the women disappear into the back and all of that. Uh, and you hear the um, you know, father, the husband, Making decisions about what the family's doing and um, whether, and, and as if he's the sole authority. But having lived in this family and seen, and this happened to be a family of five daughters and one son, so it was, so it was sort of, uh, and they lived as a nuclear family, but it, it was very um, woman heavy. And these, these girls were um, educated, and 
in many respects, they were making the big decisions in the sense that they knew more about the, the matter at hand um, and had different kinds of experiences. And so in this particular family, the father, I could see the decision making happening as a kind of a negotiation process where we have this, this almost ceremonial structure of the family and then we have the, the kind of dynamics of everyday life where um, you know, he's drawing on the expertise appropriately when he needs it. Um, I also saw the families where the father could not do that because a, a more of a defensive, one might say a defensive um, or sort of a stance of a, you know, a threat to the ego, for example. Um, and you know, in, in those kinds of situations too, an assertion of authority through violence. You know, it really, it really depends on, on the um, particular family, I think. Um, I'll just say a couple of more things. Um, so when we, when we see this family structure um, where the woman is, um, especially elite families where the woman is, is kind of almost trapped inside the house in the, in the colonial period. Um, and you know, there are accounts of you know, a woman having to sit isolated you know, and sort of being secluded so that to the extent that it affects her body that she can't even stand up straight, that kind of thing. Um, whether, uh, there's, there's one, thing that I've noted in the, in the literature, which is that European women, when they came to India, also experienced a kind of constraint on their um, behavior. And, uh, you know, in this colonial setting where we have um, colonial, you know, masculine authority, um, exerting its control, partly through the control of their own women, um, whether there's a kind of mimicry of that colonial arrangement amongst, um, amongst elite uh, Indian families. In other words, that some of the this structure you're talking about could be coming out of this kind of contact, you know, and, and the, as a strategy for expressing status. Um, sure. So, so that's, that's um, another thought. And one, one final um, thought. In, your, in the chapter, I think it was um, in the second to the last chapter, um, you were, you suggested at one point that um, the particular man you were talking about, I'm sorry, I didn't write down the details, but um, seemed to have two different desiring selves. You didn't mention that just now, but it was something I noted, this kind of characterization of, of um, these um, people. And you suggested that they're, they're not even conscious of the selves that they perform. Um, I kind of like that model because I, I also like to think about like shifting selves and people not even aware that they're that they're um, that they're not act not only not acting in the same way but not even imagining themselves in the same way. So I was um, in in one context as opposed to another. Um, and so I'm wondering if if you're thinking at all about um, you know kind of what underlying model of the self that you're using, which would be different, I think, and I, this is a more general question here, different from how these men are thinking about women or the women are thinking about, about men, but rather how you're thinking about how they navigate these complex situations. What is the status of their thoughts about themselves and about the other. 
Um, and do you have other ways of um, assessing the relationship between those thoughts that they've expressed in writing um, um, versus other thoughts they might have? Thank okay. You. Do you want me to respond to? I, uh, may I just say a few words? Mm -hmm. you, you've touched on lots of things, yeah. and uh, I'll focus one particularly. Mm -hmm. I, I do want to say that uh, a lot of what you're saying um, is, is true. There's, there's no doubt about it. Is is uh, so much of this not a product of the times categorically? So, right. We we just don't know how much was in place in this way, and it's always changing. This is an important thing, but always being represented as never having been different. That too is important. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to say it there, just yes. in that simple, simple way. Um, I also want to say um, on the strategy for expressing status, for example. Uh, yes, and the Dalits, as they become, uh, what shall we say, uh, enabled to a middle-class existence, educated, moving, they're actually very concerned that their women stay at home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so all of this, absolutely, but. Look, the uh, question that I heard, which I think is significant and important for us to think about, is w when you say, is there not some evacuation of the significance of women's lives in the home, in the kind of story that I tell? And I have several answers to that, but two particularly that uh, it seems to me uh, I want to stress. This book is called, in its subtitle, Men in the Home. <laughs> okay. For the precise reason that people just do not investigate them in the home. So as you say, the ceremonial presence, that sort of thing is known. It's also quite well known that women's, um, uh, women's part in decision making, they com the community of women and the strength they have, the fact that many husbands have no choice, husbands or fathers have no choice but to accept what the women say, all of that is true. One, I, I want to focus the question of how do men perform themselves in this, in, the, in this space, live out this particular ceremonial role. Why is it that we constantly get this notion of they don't really need to be there? Right. So let's detail that. Let's get that through. And much of the writing that I've presented to you even today, Rao Sankhden, is basically m philosophizing that condition. You know, there are good reasons for it. That's one part of the answer. And I think it needs to be done in that, d in detail, and closely attending to them in the home, where they belong, on which they depend. Critical. But the other part that I would l like to put it to you uh, is, you see, when you say, think about the frame of reference that they, that was theirs, I do not believe that the frame of reference is that rigid. Well, yes, there is an overarching frame of reference, but the proposition that somehow people inhabited it happily, even for women. See, so much of the writing has been about women and children, but women mainly, the children bit has to be done still. Uh, but. The family is women and, and children, right? And a lot of the writing has been, and a lot of the writing has exposed precisely these challenges and, and um, what shall we say, uh, unhappiness mm -hmm. with the frame of reference. So you have the frame of re reference, and I will put it to you. The question is, is it by choice or is it necessity? that makes you inhabit that thing. You, of course, people, you know, the slaves living in Jim Crow South had and produced all kinds of creative things. The wonderful music of the United States, or a church, which is a totally different church, all sorts of achievements, which are extraordinary. And we can show that for the women too. But the question is, how do, do those constraints also have other consequences? And they have phenomenal consequences. I know this from your kind of experience of living in a family, my parents' family, but hundreds of others uh, that I've seen, where the women are really champing at the bit. They're, they're, they're 
deeply uncomfortable about what they have to do, they do it because they have no choice. There are no alternatives for most women much of the time. Those emerge, they become um, more contentious or more open. They are more open quite often amongst the working peoples. But all of them allow the exclusion of the men from that space or the exclusion of men as primary inhabitants of that space. And that's really what I wanted to drive on. And it makes a difference to how they feel. Because any challenge to it immediately reveals feelings of a kind which are not okay. This is how it is. Everything's all right. You know, we go along with it. And after all, this is how God willed it, or whatever, whatever it may be. That's also there. And you have no choice. But you, you know, you, you have to think that with all of these people, and I want to say for the men too, there are actually very serious consequences. That, uh, one of the chapters I sent you talks about restlessness. The restlessness of men in the home is an extraordinary expression of their discontent with things as they are, even though they are so privileged, so comfortable. Nonetheless, they have to do things. They have to be, you know, they have to give time where they shouldn't be giving any time. Ambedkar is, uh, um, Baba Sahib Ambedkar, uh, great Dalit leader, is, um, uh, I quote this also somewhere, um, what's the word? Um, is pulled up by her, her, his first wife, a, a poor woman from a poor porter family and so on and so forth, uneducated and so on. He's, he's pulled up for not giving enough time to the family. They lost all their children except one. And he was intent on his books all of this time. And she not only um, quarrels with him, quarrels openly with him and so on, she also says when he, as a result of some of those quarrels, he would go and hide himself in his study and just work and he wouldn't come out, he wouldn't eat, he wouldn't, you know, give him, making more trouble for her. As it were. And she says, um, as the record goes, she says amongst other things, well, I was used to him acting like a child. He'll get out of it. Yeah. And so, you know, there's a lot there that is not accepting the frame of reference. The frame of reference is one of those things we live with and we negotiate. Mm -hmm. So that, that's my sense. Thanks. Why don't we, instead of my responding and our having this little conversation here, why don't we open it up for other people? Oh, yeah. you did say about <laughs> underlying um, model of self, and I just want to say one oh. other thing. I don't have an underlying model of self, wait. But, we, but a lot of the writing that, that you know, post-colonial scholars, feminist scholars, more than anything else, queer scholars, um, the, the anti-colonial knowledge world <laughs> has produced um, is a writing that speaks of selves that are almost always fragmented. All selves are fragmented. They are multiple selves pretending to be one kind of self in one context or another. Sometimes wanting to be that same kind of self in all contexts. Mm -hmm. So I would just put it there. There's not a self-generating, self-perpetuating, always existing self for anyone. Uh, my, if you want, model is simply all selves are fragmented selves. I guess I would agree. I have a book called, I mean, an article called The Illusion of Wholeness, which is precisely sure. that. Anyway, yes. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks so much for that. Just if you wouldn't mind um, calling out your name. Uh, and their space in 
You know, it's a, uh, it's a very good question and, and obviously a very important one as well. Um, students of mine and other friends have sometimes asked the same question in a slightly different way. What about queer men? You, know, and you can ask this in many, many ways. Um, my book makes it very clear. You just said the head, of the head of the household assuming that it's the father and the husband. This is not always the case. Quite often the father and the husband Bachchan's first marriage, he's not the head of the household, no, nothing like it. Quite often it is the head of the household, <laughs> who can be a chacha, who can be a grandfather, who can be, a, you know, so the extended community, the, the small family, and these are small families compared to what family generally meant, right? Whether extended or nuclear, has written into it in the South Asian context, multiple parents, multiple, not heads, because the head is just notionally at least one. Quite not always the oldest, quite often man, quite often the property owner, quite often the person bringing in the most income, quite often the man who is politically most successful or you know earns the great, the various possibilities. So all of those people are there. A lot of the other, I mean, I document that that's how the home functions in the middle. For the lowest classes, um, it, what was I going to say about that? I was going to say something more, because the, 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 the house itself is just, you know, there are no four walls that, that contain the family. The, the home, the domestic space is the mahla, is um, uh, the neighborhood and also the basti in, in one way or another. And the family extends to much of that. So I want to stress that, uh, even for the lower classes. For much of the rest, at least in elite households, middle class, upper middle class, uh, upper class households, a lot of the relatives who are not in those sorts of positions, possibly becoming heads of household, or closely enough related to have a lot of the privilege um, wash off onto them, are people of a more subordinate status. They're uh, servants or they're poorer relatives. And this, they function rather differently for that reason. The answer to your question is, I do not write about all of those people in detail. I have chosen deliberately to take the man-woman relationship, the conjugal relationship, as just representative of a range of practices and assumptions. And that's the only reason why it's husband and wife, husband and wife. Because you could, I can't write it. I mean, I've written too much here, right? <laughs> and uh, so much that I couldn't contain it within one hour. So, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I hope that answers your question. I think there's somebody there who's been, has had a hand up for a long time. Oh, Shake out. It's out of my line of sight. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Professor Ewing mentioned some objects and you began your talk talking about ordinary men but in fact, the specific uh, stories you gave are actually about the you know, prominent. Uh, and pr I, I really enjoyed you know, hearing about it. So it, it seems like a variation of subaltern here that is, we are talking about known people, but really maybe unknown aspects of their lives. So I certainly, you know, I'm not. I imagine most people would be unaware of these uh, sides to, you know, Bachchan's life or Sampradhyaya's life and so on. So I think like a very, uh, to me, very interesting, uh, um, you know, sort of development of the uh, approach to me. Uh, so that said, um, I have three very specific thing, questions which I, uh, you may just have to speak up a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I, uh, three things that you know, I think I missed, you know, because I didn't catch everything that you said. Um, one was uh, uh, that that scene you described of uh, a coming back with his uh, PhD and uh, seeing the wife and upset and she breaks down and tells him 
So did that result in any change in him? Uh, or did he simply record that as something that happened? And uh, my, my second question was, I, I didn't catch the name of this. Uh, I think it's a Marathi uh, woman who's in the third theme uh, that you mentioned in that chapter, uh, to the work class Baby Kamble. Baby Kamble. Same for you. The similarity to Paya, uh, which is what the English word Paya comes from. And, uh, but I, when I looked it up, it seemed like it's a common Dalit name in Nepal. So I was struck by the coincidence uh, across the subtitle. Yeah. I didn't mention that she came from the Dalit background because her daughter, I've spoken, I didn't mention that Kamada was from a Dalit background. Because her daughter, there was the one word she didn't want me to put in. She oh. said to me, uh, and so I'm sharing this only because you were... Oh, no, I read it it's in Wikipedia. No, no, it, it's a very common name. Oh. Uh, every, everybody I, who knew Nepal said that to me straight away. But her representation of... And she, she doesn't appear in my Dalit chapter, particularly in the thing. It's important. Because she saw herself as this emerging young intellectual in a middle-class milieu, uh, a, a world where changing the world through intellectual and political work and social work was what mattered, and that's what she became. She became um, a member of the Sahitya Academy, and you know, very well known, very well established. And so the Kalam Kasipahi, the the notion of we are soldiers of the sword, uh, of the of the pen, is her um, her construction of herself. And I want to honor that. That's the reason I didn't mention that. I, I just called her and I asked, I asked Jaya, the daughter, is it okay if I say she came from a lower caste and uh, lower class background? And she said, yes, yes. She said, look, I don't even mind if, if you say Dalit, but it was not used, which is correct. The Dalit movement wasn't what it was. And in Kalimpong, where they lived uh, at that time, but perhaps even today, the Dalit movement may not have the kind of resonance that it has in Maharashtra and Tamil Nadu and, you know, and so on. So anyway, uh, on your first one, I just want to say one little thing. It's, a, it's an actually an interesting um, observation, the subaltern studies one. <coughs> and I want to say the two, two reasons why the subaltern reference, and I, I only use the subaltern reference because <laughs> it was Cathy had already used it. But the reference to the marginalized and the subordinated and that that is written out of history was the important thing. That, that's what I'm concerned about. I do not think subaltern studies, for at the beginning perhaps it looked like that, that it was about the poorer classes and the, the lowest of the low and so on and so forth. And many people always believe that's what it should be. Subaltern studies, I think, graduated very quickly to asking about power relations that produce those consequences. And that's basically where this goes. And subaltern studies also, I think, very quickly graduated to thinking what counts as knowledge, what counts as history. Why is this not history, right? Why is it that, n that remarkable scholarship on the domestic world, on family life, and so on and so forth, why is it that no one has felt it consequential enough to have men located in that space and inquire into that. So that's why I chose to do this. It, fi it fits within that frame, but it's a very broad frame of what, not just subaltern studies, of what all kinds of oppositional scholarship, critical scholarship has done for a very long time. I run, for that reason, I run the colonial po post-colonial studies workshop in, in Emory, and I say every year, that this is not a chronological or a geographical category, the, the post-colonial. This is a category of knowledge, because virtually all the knowledge that we have inherited is colonial knowledge. 
it is in those frames it is it is established as knowledge through through criteria that's laid down in those ways must come from that archive you know oral history didn't count until the african uh, historians finally fought their way into establishing it as legitimate but all the way so i think it's very important for us constantly to ask this question why is this not being inquired into why is it that we have not paid attention to what is so obvious i mean you know what i'm going what i get, get as a response to some of what i'm uh, written is the response but we all know this <laughs> and it's true in some as you in say <laughs> in a kind of what should we say m uh, broad arch uh, way a kind of um, what was the word you used? It was a very good one. <laughs> yeah. Not the uh, not the impressionistic, the ceremonial. Oh, yeah. The cere so in a ceremonial way, we know all of this, but we don't know how it was lived, and that matters, it seems to me. And subaltern studies should have been concerned with that from the beginning. I think it was to some extent, but not self-consciously. No, Sorry. The board question. Oh, I'm sorry, you asked that question. Um, and I have to say, I don't, I don't have an answer to that, in the sense that I don't know. Uh, I will say, I, d I doubt that, uh, that Mamu, thanks for coming. Thank you. Um, I, I suspect that Bachchan, like his son, Amitabh, would never have got out of the mindset that what he was, that he's a kind man, he is, there's no doubt about it that what he was doing was okay, right? I want to stress once again, I think his being back here and the success that they had as a couple and he as, as a, a teacher and a poet and a bureaucrat, all of those things made their life much more comfortable, much easier. And Teji is just so talented, and I, I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting if, if one investigated Teji's life, it would be full of contradictions, no, without doubt. But I'm just simp simply saying that in spite of all these constraints and difficulties and the nature of man, in spite of all of that, she was immensely creative and able to do within those constraints a huge amount. And she continued to do it. I think she was the strength in the family, in the end. So we're, um, we have, um Three yeah. questions. Do you mind if we take the questions and then Let, absolutely. allow you? Okay, so first you, and then you, and then you. Hi, hi I, I, my name is Naman. I'm from the New School. Naman. Naman. Um, I, it was a great talk, and I'm excited to read the book. Uh, my question, I mean, you're, uh, it's related to the previous two questions, but I wanted to know about the kind of paradoxes that emerge when um, me, how men see other men from different groups, like how a Muslim man would see a Hindu man, and how a Hindu man would see a, 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 a Muslim man, and the kind of, and if they have a friendship, what kind of, how, how is it paradoxical, if, if there are any paradoxes that emerge? But I know you mentioned your project was about men and women, and husband and wife, but there are a lot of interfaith couples as well, how would like a um, Hindu man would look at a Muslim woman, or a Muslim man would look at a Hindu woman, and then, how they look at each other. I mean, yeah, just about that. Thank you so much. Yeah. You know, I have more of a comment. First, I want to uh, appreciate and acknowledge the contributions this book will make uh, in historical literature, in general studies, in the study of masculinity and men at home. Uh, I had the privilege of reading the manuscript that uh, Professor Pandey shared with me. And I felt that, and I also continue to feel that this book uh, brings alive what has been advocated, propounded, professed by men uh, as the dominant ideology that acts both as a continuum and as a break. And that ideology is even in a way we are attending to the very intimate personal registers of these men coming from all different backgrounds, they're still upholding women, which we see in another form of literature, particularly in the, in the you know, domestic manuals and uh, pedagogy and you know, normative literature of the time, where men constructed women as the mother. And this is something that they also lived in their personal life. 
you know, I would like to hear something different probably, you know, about more, you know, intimate encounters or relationship between the couple in their conjugal lives, which we get some, you know, I, I read. There's actually yeah, lots more than, there, than yeah, what you've seen. They, they are there, but not as explicit as putting women on the pedestal as mothers uh, in many ways. And then in real life, women also, we also see it how women kind of internalized and were complicit. Women, and you have, you have you know, called examples from women from all different backgrounds, from Teji to Kamlin, who all subscribe to this ideology of, or, or the myth making of men are like that. You know, men cannot attend to the personal needs, the intimate needs of a woman. So I see that in, you know, that your work, which so deeply attends to the personal registers of men, personal lives, intimate lives of men, and women kind of carry that forward. So that's my comment, you know, the, the intersection of ideology and lived experiences. Hi, my name is Sri. Um, I have a small question going back to the end of the title, Men and Women. Um, do we get a sense of how these men conceived the space of the domesticity in itself. Um, what I'm trying to get at is how did they see their role or their contribution to the domestic, to the site of the home. I, I know you mentioned that for the home, they also extend to the mahalla and the neighborhood and things like that. But the space of the domesticity, and something that you said kind of stayed with me, is that there seems to be a recurring theme of an infantilization of men. The Matri Karuna and the uh, Omen are like that. Uh, he's like a child, somebody uh, that's a comic. So at the same time, these men claim to be man eaters, and that's the larger purpose of life to go out and see the world. So with these two frames, how does the men then come the men themselves see their role in domesticity? Do you see any at all? And how do you place this infantilization? What is their conception of it? Do you have a sense of that in the writings or the other narratives that come Yeah, Shirupa, that's a difficult uh, set of questions because I'm not, uh, I, I, I might come back and ask you to clarify some, some of that. Um, and let me just respond, Naman, you said? I'll respond to your thing, uh, Naman, first. Um, <clears throat> by saying you realize that for the vast majority of men, and women in South Asia, certainly in the period that I was talking about, but to a large extent till today, marriage and domestic life is within the community. Yeah. Indeed, within some section of the community. Yeah. So caste amongst Muslims too. <laughs> you don't go to, you know, Muslims who are not as high-born and so on and so forth, and, and Sikhs and Christians. And so uh, it's important to bear that in mind. This does not say that there are no, um, uh, what shall we say, exceptions or no breaks from that. Especially as time has gone on, there have been many more breaks, and there's, um, that's why the Hindu right wing now talks about love jihad, you know, this is what's happening, they're stealing our women and so on. And this has been a long stand. So there's a certain kind of rhetoric and a certain, what shall we say, um, dissemination of particular news as news when it is ideology. Right, that's gone on for a very long time. In actual practice, as you know, and as I know, I mean, I, I went through school and college where, except for the names, we didn't know what background, what the background meant. The names meant somebody was Muslim or Christian or Hindu, Sikh maybe. But many of those names were also shared. More than that, they were just like us, right? So. One of my closest or longer, lo longest term colleagues in, uh, longest term is the right word, colleagues in subaltern studies is Shahid Amin. Shahid and I were undergraduates together from the age of 16. We were postgraduate students, no, I, he, I left um, for Oxford before he became a postgraduate, he was a year junior to me. Um, and um, we were graduate students together in Oxford. We were professors together in, in uh, <coughs> Delhi. We, the longest, we had, through all of that time, no 
encounter where the fact of his being a Muslim and my being a Hindu counted. Yet when they, we went home, it would have counted in various ways, what you ate and what you didn't eat. I've, I've said to many, many people who ask about my food restrictions, do you have dietary restrictions? I say I'm a secular Indian and the way in which we defined our secularism that was that we all went out and ate beef and pork. <laughs> and Shahid and I would do that all of the time until, and this is very important, until the Hindu right wing came up and became the kind of danger, um, threat that it has become for minorities in India. And at that point I found in a, in a, at a dinner in Calcutta when Shahid and I, my, one of the friends had gone to a Chinese restaurant, that he flinched very slightly when I suggested ordering a pork dish. And so I abused him, as I would any friend. <laughs> I said, what the hell do you mean? Yeah. Uh, and he said, no, 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 it's OK, it's OK. But it was only when I went home that he, that he realized what that meant, that he was actually being made aware of his Muslimness, in, which, mm. in a way he'd never been aware of it before. So I can't answer the question, how did men from these places see each other? My father, who was kind of, in today's terms, uh, he was a kind of soft Hindu nationalist, okay? He was also a remarkable lover of Indo-Muslim culture, of the Ghazal and, and Shairi. And so on. This, he reveled in it. This was his world. Um, why did I bring my father up? Who knows? <laughs> uh, uh, my, my father had, all right, so in, in spite of this kind of orthodox upbringing, in which, which is completely contradictory, almost always, um, he had very close Muslim friends. Firak Gorakhpuri, well, do you think of him as Muslim or do you think of him as Hindu? He, he frowned upon everybody who was Hindu. He frowned upon Hindi, the great poet, lived like a Muslim. Uh, so there are people even in the orthodox groups, even at a time when they would not stray out of their community to come in, who had friendships and who shared every festival together. In our time, much more so, right? And so that's gone on. I don't know how one can generalize about that. It's there. There's an ideological weight that people have to battle against, which has become worse in recent times. But at individual levels, wherever the opportunity has arisen, that has not counted for anything. Not between Pakistan and India, nothing. You know, I, when my wife and I went to Pakistan, for one and only time, um, young people, just we meet in uh, what were the places where you used to go to, cafes where you could do email, etc., <laughs> because we didn't have those facilities. Young people who would, who would in one breath, in the same breath, say, we hear there are no mosques left in India. And then in the next breath they would say, can you help us come to India? <laughs> so, you know, these are very contradictory words. You're living, you're inhabiting all of this. Those of us who are fairly self-conscious about this know that those things did not count. They, what counted was a class and cultural community, right? Where you went to school, who, you know, which which sort of spaces you inhabited and so on. And this kind of, across the board, which is true. But community remains a significant fact in the lives of most people, especially when it comes to marriage, as, as you know. And so that's all one can say. I mean, it, yeah, it's, it's long-winded. It's, yeah. Okay? Um, Sri Rupa, you might have to explain your question to me, because... Um, Shopna's um, comment I, I like, I don't want to uh, respond to it too much. Uh, I, thi I think you were saying something important about the dominant I ideology is holding up the woman as mother, that there are other dimensions of it which one need, needs to uh, br bring to bear. And the intimate needs and the intimate lives of men and women figure in my book, but you see, it, it's not the primary concern. It's important to mark that. The primary concern is what you call uh, a structure. <laughs> of, yeah? And what that does to push people into certain kinds of being, certain kinds of living it out. And therefore, it doesn't have, it, it, the chapters that you did not read, there's the chapter on the independence generation, Bachchan and, 
and um, Muslim intellectuals and, and bureaucrats um, who are people who it's about their romance and their lives and they and yet that they inhabit the same structures and the Dalit ones has a different quality to it eh? so each, each chapter does rather different things which is good I mean because who can write a book about men in the home <laughs> in <laughs> India <laughs> yeah, South Asia I mean I, I say South Asia because yeah. of course it is India and Pakistan Sri Rupa, I heard the thing, how did these men conceive of the space of domesticity? And I, I ask, I'm, I'm asking you to clarify your question because I thought that's what I was speaking about. I thought that in some senses, that's what I'm saying. Do they see any role there? And the answer is, I only said this once um, today, but it, it's the beginning of my book. Men are very much a present absence presence, absence. My father was like that, but all sorts of people. Amongst Dalit communities, it's hard to be present, absent, because there is no place <laughs> to be present. I thought at one point that you might be asking about literally the space of the home and their relationship to it, the houses, and whether they feel they have to do anything. There. But you might have been saying something else. I think uh, you've clarified the question uh, sufficiently for me. Uh, you see, I think that some of them, the, the more extreme, like Rahul Sankritan, who really thought of himself as a ghumakkar, right, and was in, in real life to a large extent, don't seem to think that they inhabit the domestic world at all. They think it's just there, and you know they don't they don't need it, so they're actually in denial completely. Someone like Bachchan thinks, and many, many others, a very large number of people, think of this as the place as retreat, as the place you come back to, as a place of solace, of comfort, of love. And they, they, they are, including Sankhstan, they are actually very loving people quite often. Their real task is somewhere else. Their real task in their heads too is somewhere else, is not in that space. But the place is there. What once again they are in denial about is that it would not be there, but for very hard work on the part of various people. And what Bachchan articulates is what mo most traditional people would articulate, which is the man's responsibility extends only so far as to provide for the family, to allow for the setting up of the home and to maintain it that his responsibility extended only to bringing in the income. Teji took, took care of everything else. And this is very, very common. Amongst the working classes, that can't be. Right? So you get a rather different take on it. And very, uh, more often than amongst the upper and middle classes, you also get women who are the primary income earners. So, you know, it mud, mud, muddies up the thing in, in various ways. But it seems to be very clear that they, their sense of their role is Yes, we should be there, we are fathers and so on and so forth, you know, we should, we should spend some time. But our real work is somewhere else. Our real duties are elsewhere and this is a place of retreat. So Rajan Prashad writes repeatedly about how he went home whenever he was ill, whenever he was, whenever he was really tired and so on. But there are very few people who are so honest about it. Okay? Uh, what I would, and this will be my last. No, no, really, because you have to clarify what you were saying. Yeah, I wasn't so clear about it. The reason why I brought it was because the men at homeness, then what is the sense of at homeness? Yeah, one of the first. Is this just a retreat? Is this a more involved engagement with the domestic? Is it a sense of that place? Uh, that was what I was trying Sri to say. Rupa, think about the, the phrase I've used. Why do I say men at home and not men in the home? 
because men in the home would be descriptive. It would say, okay, now what's that? Mm. Men at home is actually a statement, and I say I have it categorically in, in an early chapter as a sentence. Many of these men seem to be ma more at home outside the home than at home. <laughs> okay? And they treated it only in this, this exceptional moments we need to be in that space. It's that kind of thing. And the entire book is full of that. The other thing that you said, and it's sorry. Uh, other thing that you said I just want to uh, comment on uh, because I, I think there's something very interesting there. When you said the Matra Karuna is an infantilizing of men, right? It's an infantilizing of men only when the women respond to it. The women know that they have to look after these men and that the men are incapable of also. And so they often say, like Ambedkar's first wife, Ramabai, says, <laughs> I knew, he's like a child. One just has to handle them this way. Many women actually think of the men like that. I understand that. And it's important to mark that. I probably haven't underlined it the way you did. But the men are not at all thinking they're infantilizing themselves. That's important to remember. They are adults from birth, almost. In any case, they're adults once they're beyond being boys. You know. And they are these independent, fully self-constituted, self-generating, I mean, in spite of the fact that they had mothers whom they worship, they think of themselves as these fully constituted beings who need nothing else. They, there is not, by and large, even amongst the most wasteful of men, the real layabouts, there is little sense of self-doubt. There's little sense that we're in, like infants in this thing. They are very rare things. So, I don't know if you were suggesting an infantilizing of them themselves in their proposition about the Matra Karuna, because that's not the case. What, what Matra Karuna does and what you were saying, Shopna, about woman as mother, is actually lift woman to a non-living being. It's an ethereal existence, you know, which, well, what can we do? These are extraordinary beings. They do not have ordinary physical, emotional needs. You know, it's that kind of proposition. It's a construction of them that matters. Men, like all, all power holders anyway, are invisible. They do not describe themselves. Which is why the women's descriptions of them, periodically, is as powerful as it is. Yeah, uh, yeah, just thank you very much for the really interesting book. And I'm looking forward to reading your book. But um, I noticed when you answered to it, you said South Asia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, but you forgot Sri Lanka. And uh, uh, Sri Lanka... If the one area that I know so little sadly about. sadly went through what India is going through now with the Hindu nationalism, but it went through the Buddhist nationalism much earlier. And, and what happened was a, a separation, exactly what's happening when you describe it, of sort of you know, anything that's different from Buddhist uh, national, you know, Buddhism is is, and so you've got a, a complete exodus of anybody who is Christian, you know, the Christian population declined, etc. And now you see what's happening with the Muslim population, some Muslim problems and shit there. So it's it's interesting to see that in India, which I've always admired because they never took on this uh, Britain, uh, English, English is the colonial language, we have to get rid of English, which is what they did in Sri Lanka with the consequences that the communities completely integrated, you know, and where they were able to communicate, they no longer could. And then you have the 30-year war, which didn't help and so on and so forth. It's interesting. I just want to remind you that there is another country in South Africa. And, and there's Nepal, and there's Bhutan. No, no, there are more countries than, <laughs> that I've named. There's no, And Burma would have been part of South Asia if it hadn't it's been split Asia. off in 1937. <laughs> so I, I, I just want to say, I, I do actually make the point in the book that what I'm saying does not apply only to those three countries or just to South Asia. It applies with its inflections, with these different histories in different parts and, of the world. And also because Sri Lanka is really, uh, was a part of India, really. I mean, I shouldn't say that, uh, but it was. <laughs> so it's very, very similar to India, as opposed to Burma, which is Myanmar, which is Anyway, thank okay. you. Okay. Well, we're way out of time, so thank you so much for this thank you really for stimulating Thanks. Yeah, it was a very nice wonderful. discussion. I yeah, enjoyed that. Yeah. So.